everyone? Can everyone hear me in the back? Yeah? Okay, excellent. So, hi everyone. Welcome to the Wisconsin Maritime Museum. My name is Caroline Deemer, and I am the programming coordinator here at the museum. Um, and I'm so excited to welcome you all to this month's Think and Drinks. Um, Think and Drinks, for anyone who are new, are a free monthly speaker series that happens on the first Thursday evening of every month. Um, so this year, in celebration of the USS Cobias, our lovely submarine outside's um, 80th launch anniversary, we are hosting a year of free talks focused on interesting and often untold stories from World War II. Um, so I am super excited about this talk and all of the talks that we have coming up. So if you like this one, check out our schedule. We've got a lot of cool ones coming down the pipeline as well. Um, I would like to thank our sponsor for this talk, the Wisconsin Humanities Council. Um, the Wisconsin Humanities Council is one of the reasons we can have these talks be free. Um, and they strengthen democracy through cultural programs that build connections and understanding between people of all backgrounds and beliefs throughout the state. So we're super happy to have them sponsoring these programs. Um, so they are the reason why we've got, um, I'm able to bring, or I'm able to introduce you guys, um, our awesome speaker for tonight. Um, we have Joy Block from UW-Madison, and she's going to be talking to us um, about Japanese internment, racism, Americanism, and just the perspectives from Wisconsin. So take it away, Joy. <laughs> So when you hear about Japanese internment racism and Americanism, it covers a very broad history, even though uh, Japanese American history is kind of a small part of what was going on in World War II. And I want to bring a perspective to this that you might not have had before. <clears throat> when we talk about sort of the Japanese American experience in World War II, you'll see this kind of picture a lot. Uh, this map. So if you notice here, all along the western coast, uh, this was the area where Japanese Americans ended up being excluded from. Uh, there were a lot of uh, like military operations there, uh, centers that were uh, had importance, top secret things. Um, and it was also on the side that was closest to Japan. So the federal government became concerned of having Japanese Americans in this area and decided to relocate them all. Now, this is significant because there were quite a lot of them. Um, even though there were a lot more people, obviously, on the West Coast, there were still like 130,000 people who got um, at, uh, evacuated, right, to relocated, had to leave this space entirely. And where they went to were places like these, the Triangles. These were internment camps. And so you can tell the story either from the West Coast, right, where the story is, Japanese Americans were here, they left, re were lo relocated, they lived in the internment camps for several years, then many of them came back, right, and then had to sort of recuperate, figure things out. So that's one way of telling the story. You can also tell the story where you're talking all about life in the internment camps, right? Who was there, what their experience was. Um, it was a time of, uh, sort of deep depression for a lot of people who felt like they had been Americans and America did not recognize them as such. And their loyalty was questioned. Um, there was actually a questionnaire that they had to uh, fill out at one point in time saying that they owed all of their loyalty to the United States. But it was a very confusing questionnaire and people wondered whether it was a way to trick them. Um, because, I mean, they just lost all their homes and stuff too, right? And so there were people who said, like, no, I'm not going to commit my loyalty to you when you just did this to me, right? And and that was a part of then also confirming for many people, see, they are disloyal to begin with, right? So this is a whole different side of the story that you could talk about. And I'll mention both of these a bit, but... I actually want to tell you about the view from Wisconsin, because when the other two ways of telling the story, it's all sort of happening over there, right, far away from us. But if you see that star Camp McCoy, 
That's at least one place in Wisconsin that has to do with this story. And I'm going to tell you some other parts to it as well. Now, I got a, um, a, a research project a while back and the UW-Madison uh, Public History Project. And so I was going through the archives at UW and it was really exciting because I started discovering Japanese American World War II history right here in Wisconsin. And I'd never heard these stories before. And so today I get to share some of them with you. Um, this is our history. Even though it might seem like it's far away, this is our Wisconsin history too. And so I wanted to be able to bring that to you all today. Um, I did mention I'm a grad student at UW in history right now. I study Asian American history. Uh, I just on Monday turned in a full draft of my dissertation. So I have not been sleeping, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit frazzled, you might notice, but um, hopefully when I forget words or all of the like numbers that would come to my mind. I have some notes here, so hopefully I'll go back to those. <laughs> um, so here's some of the Wisconsin stories. Um, Japanese Americans, you might notice them in um, uh, clothes that are more popular from the era. You might notice uh, UW Madison and the Lincoln statue right there. Um, you might notice uh, these guys are boxers on the UW boxing team. And so these are just some pictures uh, taken in Wisconsin uh, of Japanese Americans who are living here. The family in the middle, all of the kids in that family were uh, born and raised in Wisconsin, which at this time you might have be surprised to know <laughs> that's what, what was going on too. So these are some stories, as I said. Okay, but I do want to give you a brief overview of uh, Japanese American history, World War II history in general uh, to sort of give an idea. So um, I noted that Japanese Americans were moved out, evacuated, uh, relocated, <clears throat> moved out of the West Coast. And uh, there were a lot of reasons for this. Um, but one of the key reasons was actually racism. And uh, I know every time somebody says that word, it's like, wow, well, what are we talking about? But this was very uh, deep seated uh, racial ideas about Japanese Americans that they, it was impossible for them to ever assimilate and become Americans. Uh, race and racism at the, uh, at the time wasn't just about the color of your skin. It had to do with things like your uh, cultural qualities, the things that you value, the things, uh, character qualities, right? All of these things were wrapped up in people's minds with what race people were. And that was also their bloodline, right? So if you had a certain blood coming from a certain race, you were always going to be that race. You weren't going to be able to just assimilate, particularly not Asians, because people considered Asians to be so different racially from European uh, races or race that um, that there was just they were never going to be able to truly value democracy. They were never going to be able to really value independent thinking, right? These things that Americans value couldn't possibly be done. So we actually had a bunch of exclusion laws. We didn't, in the United States, we didn't want Asians to immigrate unless they were coming to be our labor. That's always great. Um, but we, when they started immigrating for labor, then we really didn't want them to at least become citizens because then they would have to have rights and we'd have to treat them equally and none of that. So actually we had some laws that said that um, Asian Americans were not allowed to become citizens in the United States if they had immigrated ever, right? They cannot naturalize. And they were considered aliens um, ineligible for citizenship was their term that they was used for them. So Japanese Americans fit into this, you know, Asian American uh, group. The one thing was that there was a uh, Supreme Court case in the late 1800s that gave people the right to, um, if they were born in the United States, they could be U.S. citizens no matter what their race was. And so Japanese Americans had a, of all the Asian Americans in the U.S., uh, they had a special thing where because the uh, government of Japan was so strong, they were actually allowed to bring women over. So usually the men were coming to work 
and they were able to bring, they called them picture brides. Uh, if you think about, uh, you know, writing a, a letter, a picture, sending it across and being like, do you, you know, will you marry me? <laughs> right? That's what men were coming over, sending uh, queries back, trying to get women to come. And if the girl got off the boat and they were interested, then they got married and they started lives here. And that allowed Japanese Americans to uniquely be able to have a second generation of American citizens. So you get to World War II and Japanese Americans have this first generation who's never allowed to be a citizen. Uh, they're called the Nisei in Japanese. And then you have the second generation, the American born children, the Nisei, starts with an N. And um, the, the Nisei, at this time in World War II, they're starting to go to college graduate from college, right? That's the age. And uh, college should also trigger like military service, right? That's that's the age that they're at. So all of that as a background, um, Lieutenant General John DeWitt was in charge of um, the uh, War Department's uh, relocating Japanese Americans. And in 1944, he and his uh, department or program had to give their final report, right? Where they say, this is why we did it. And here's why it was right. <laughs> right? Um, so this is a report where they're trying to, they're looking at it very uh, positively, like, look at how great it was. Look how good we did. And um, as it's a highly favorable account, right? Um, but the, one of the key things was that it contained a lot of false claims uh, about Japanese Americans having been engaged in espionage, uh, like um, particularly, what's it called, with uh, sort of uh, lights signaling, right, from the shore, uh, and, um, and I think it was like radio communication. So those were the two things. This report says those were totally happening, absolutely. Uh, Turns out later, uh, what was it? The Justice Department talked to the FBI and some other places, found out those were not true. And in fact, probably John DeWitt knew that at the time. Uh, but these are, you know, ways once people heard this report and they were like, whoa, all of these Japanese Americans doing all of this uh, stuff, then they were really on board and were like, yeah, this was a great thing. So glad you all did this. Uh, and maybe don't bring them back to the West Coast anytime soon, right? So that was the response to this in 1944. So I want to share part of the rationale to really point to this, how race functioned in these uh, um, decision-making, right? Because it is true, we were at war with Japan, right? And it makes sense that you would be looking at all the people uh, who had connections with the country that were now at war with um, when we were also at war with Germany and Italy. And there are some Germans and Italians that ended up being uh, put uh, in internment camps or under surveillance, right? Because they were legitimately trying to do things. And so there were probably also some Japanese Americans who were disloyal, right? But almost all the cases that they said, this is disloyalty, were not. So. Uh, to be clear, yeah, that's one of the things that comes out about it. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> so here's one of the lines from this explanation. In the war in which we are now engaged, racial affinities are not severed by migration. The Japanese race is an enemy race. And while many second and third generation Japanese born on United States soil, <coughs> possessed of United States citizenship, have become Americanized, the racial strains are undiluted, right? So when I said that this was a racial thing, I wasn't just like calling it out myself, right? That people said that. And granted, he was far more explicit than anybody wanted him to be. He got in trouble for that. But um, th there it was. He was the commanding officer and was saying these things, or at least signed off on when his committee uh, wrote the report. So uh, another line was that there was no ground for assuming that any Japanese barred from assimilation by convention as he is, though born and raised in the United States, will not turn against this nation when the final test of loyalty comes, right? So these are even the kids who have lived their whole lives there. He says no ground for assuming that they would be loyal. Um, 
And in fact, they mentioned the very fact that no sabotage has taken place by 1944 is a disturbing and confirming indication that such action will be taken. Right? Man, they're just hiding it. Right? So, um, so yeah, this was uh, the sort of basis and way of thinking that lay behind all of that. So the executive order 9066, this was what FDR signed in February that um, uh, sort of set everything in motion. It was saying, we got to get all Japanese Americans out of the West Coast. There was like a sort of bounded space. So um, there were actually internment camps in like Western California out in the desert. Um, but yeah, so um, imagine with me, if you will, you were uh, farming, right? And uh, you, you're a farmer. This is the middle of February and March when in California, you have crops in the ground. We don't really do that here, but you do in California. And um, when Pearl Harbor happened, Japanese Americans knew something was going to go down, right? You don't live under this kind of exclusion and think that you're, the country that you're connected to is going to war and it's not going to blow back on you. But they didn't know that they were going to lose everything in California and be moved someplace else. So um, FDR's decision about this um, came as kind of a shock, right? So maybe you are a farmer, maybe you are a grocer and you either have a grocery store or you manage one, right? Maybe you have um, a clothing business, right? Uh, maybe you are um, a college student or a school student, right? Middle of February and March is the middle of your semester, right? And the big question was like, what do you do? <laughs> you, you know it's gonna come down at some point in time. Uh, March 12th, uh, let me just make sure my number's right. March 24th <laughs> was when they started saying, uh, March 24th, everybody's going to be evacuated by the military. And um, before that, you could leave voluntarily. They called it voluntary relocation, since, of course, you were choosing to do it, right? Um, that meant if you left, then you didn't have to go to the internment camps. You could go someplace else, you know, wherever you magically had connections. And um, and it was hard. Uh, people who waited, like, sometimes they would be trying to figure out ways to sell their property, pass it off to their neighbors, hope that they would give it back, right? Um, all of this trying to, to batten things down because you're going to be leaving and you don't know how long, right? So that's all going on for them with the executive at order. Now, the number, in case you were wondering what the number in the title was, 125,284, that's how many Japanese Americans were interned. Um, and these are some pictures of uh, Dorothea Lang is a famous photographer, and um, Ansel Adams is also, you might have seen some of his pictures. Usually we see his like landscapes, right? But both of them were hired by the War Relocation Authority to take pictures of Japanese Americans and um, starting like even before they left for um, the camps and then into the camps. Uh, Dorothea Lang's were too honest, and so they actually didn't uh, let anybody see them at the time. Uh, Ansel Adams did a little bit more like glorifying how happy Japanese Americans were in the internment camp, so his guy had a little bit more. Um, but I'm going to read, I, um, as an academic, there's always the problem, like, you write all your stuff, right? Or you just sort of speak extemporaneously. I have written this down, so I'm going to read it. But I have some different pictures that I want to flip through for you. And hopefully they'll kind of match what I'm talking as I go and uh, give you sort of a picture of this internment experience. So Japanese Americans had sensed after February that they needed to prepare their fields, homes, and businesses for an unknown departure date. And they had been trying to prepare for whatever might happen. But when they actually received their evacuation orders, they usually only had a week or two notice, and they were forced to sell their property uh, or prized possessions for a fraction of their value. Um, and so Japanese Americans were supposed to bring all their own bedding, 
cooking gear and household items. And they had to bring everything with them because no personal goods would be mailed to the centers. On their assigned dates, they were bused to one of 16 assembly centers near their homes. Now, assembly centers had been very hurriedly composed and were pretty horrible accommodations for the families who were brought to them. Oh, these are still some of the getting ready. Um, and you'll notice there's a lot of kids in these, right? Because um, about 60%, I think, of those who were interned were uh, citizens of the United States. So they had to be second generation. Um, okay, so here we are at the assembly centers. Yeah, so they're really hurriedly composed, right? They only had like a month. Uh, one of the places, kinds of places that they would put people were like empty race tracks or fairgrounds. So a lot of people have memories of sleeping in horse stalls um, that still smell like horses. You can't get that out very easily. Um, so yeah, and families are all coming with them. Um, although most Japanese Americans had obediently followed the evacuation orders, they were horrified to find that they were expected to sleep in these places. When they were taken to internment camps, here we are at internment camps, further inland, locations like Arizona, Utah, Wyoming, Arkansas, the situations were not much better. I really like this picture here. Um, this guy's son learned to walk in an internment camp. So this is a picture of his son's first steps. Um, Most of these places were collections of barracks in desert or swamp-like locations, encircled by barbed wire, watchtowers, prison guards. And during the next two or three years of imprisonment, Japanese Americans would form a variety of social organizations to continue on with life, educating their kids, organizing free time activities, uh, having sort of jobs and work, establishing entities of self-government, but all of them were with the understanding that camp life was supposed to more fully Americanize the Japanese American inhabitants there. So another thing, uh, baseball, <clears throat> good American tradition, right? Uh, was one of the parts that they um, did. So that number, the 100, what was it? 120 something, 130,000. Um, that is actually less than half the Japanese Americans in the United States. Sometimes we think that the internment experience was the whole thing of what it was, right? But a hundred, uh, this is a round number, but about 158,000 Japanese Americans lived on the Hawaiian Islands. And so their experience was very different. Uh, they didn't have the same kind of mass internment camps. Um, they did have some internment camps, but they tended to be, I think it was like maybe 2,000 of the inhabitants uh, were considered disloyal enough to put in an internment camp. Um, and usually, I mean, like, I'm guessing there might have been some people who were actually disloyal. Lots of times these were community leaders because that was one of the, the groups of people that they tended to say, oh, these are the ones with enough connections that would, could really cause problems. Um, so uh, here we have that. Uh, the Hawaiian Islands did, however, all get put under martial law. So they didn't have to leave their homes, lose a lot of property, lose a lot of value in the things that they owned, but they did get under, I mean, they, they were under military rule, right? You couldn't just do whatever you wanted to there. Um, so Japanese Americans were really built into the fabric of Hawaii in a way that they weren't on the mainland. Um, exclusion hadn't worked quite as well there because so many Japanese Americans had come. They were, I think they were about 30% of the population at this time in Hawaii. And um, the groups were still fairly racially divided because a lot of different uh, racial groups had been brought in to be labor, and usually they'd kind of been used against each other. So they weren't always super friendly, um, but there was like intermarriage and stuff like that that just didn't happen as much on the uh, Western coast. Um, and Japanese Americans were really involved. So uh, these guys here were a part of the Hawaii National Guard, right? They were already 
participating in things. This They were Nisei, so they were second generation, uh, seeing themselves as, uh, Hawaii wasn't a state yet, so um, they, in that sense, weren't um, Americans by state, right? But they're part of the territory that that's, they saw themselves as part of America. And when Pearl Harbor happened, uh, most of the Nisei were just like horrified. They wanted to go and participate on the U.S. side. Um, and so they, you know, tried to join up into the military. Um, the U.S. government, not okay with that, right? So they actually, um, especially in, I think it was in February, they said nobody, everybody who was uh, Japanese American in like the National Guard or um, military is kind of on reserve, right? We're not going to trust you with anything <laughs> right now. Um, but they couldn't get rid of the guys who had been in the Hawaii National Guard already. And so they turned them into a battalion called the 100th Battalion. Uh, it was separate. It wasn't connected with another one. And it was only Japanese Americans. And they came to Camp McCoy here in Wisconsin for about six months to do training. Uh, this this group was initially composed mostly of the Hawaiian Japanese Americans. Uh, so if you can imagine, uh, their first snow was our snow, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, they were here from, uh, I think it was June to December. So they, they got that snow. And this was also when Camp McCoy was just beginning. So when they first came, they bivouacked in tents. There weren't any barracks there. And in fact, they all celebrated when in September they got to move into the, the barrack itself. Um, so this was their experience of the mainland too. It was one of the first ones. They ended up going down to, I think, Mississippi afterwards for some more training. And um, they were in some ways kind of surprised that some of the things that they'd heard about the mainland being really against Japanese Americans uh, didn't happen quite as much here in Wisconsin, mostly because we didn't have as many. And so there hadn't been decades of uh, resentment building up between people uh, who were competing over jobs and other things. Um, so they would go on uh, out on their paths, right, to whatever the, the local town was. And uh, people always didn't know what to do with them. So there is that. But they sort of built some good relationships here in Wisconsin, too. I've heard some stories of people who came back to Wisconsin afterwards to settle um, after they were done with their military service. Um, but so the 100th, um, uh, what was this? This would have been 30 or 42. So in 43, by August, um, or I guess maybe May, June, they went to some special training where they had to show off what they could do. And um, the U.S. government, not so sure that they were going to be able to really cut it. So they didn't really want to use them. Turns out they were amazing. And um, they uh, showed themselves so well when they were doing this uh, extensive training in Louisiana um, that it helped convince the federal government to start allowing Nisei Japanese, so that's the second generation, to, to sign up. Um, and they later on started like a, a whole much larger battalion called the 442nd, um, composed of Japanese Americans. So um, they uh, the 100th went to Italy. They were on the Italian campaign and uh, helped push Germany north of Rome. Uh, this is where I'm not a military historian. So some of you guys are going to be like, oh, yeah. Um, but uh, they are considered one of the most decorated, uh, actually, the mo 100th and the 442nd together are the most decorated ones for their size and duration uh, in World War II. So they just threw themselves into it. And um, uh, part of it was, this is also what people did at the time, right? Like a lot of people wanted to join in demonstrate that they were a part of what the U.S. was doing and helped defend the country. Japanese Americans, especially the Nisei, also had, though, the sense, like, they had to prove that they were loyal, right? They had to, they had to demonstrate, they had to put it on the line so everybody would be convinced, right? Um, okay. Oh, yeah, here's uh, when they're coming back um, afterwards. So, 
there are like a few thousand people who were able to get out during the voluntary relocation era. And um, these are some of my stories. I didn't even think about this, that this was possible before finding some stories of people in the UW archives. And so I wanted to share, this is where I'm kind of turning over to stories that I found uh, about people at the time. And so uh, my first person to tell you about is Miyoshi Ikawa. And uh, he was a student who was able to turn things around fast enough. Uh, once uh, Pearl Harbor happened, his advisor was sending out letters to all the different people who could possibly take him into their lab. Um, you know, once you get into the sort of high echelons of I think he did biochemistry, right? The things you know might not be something that can just go, you can go just work in anybody's lab, right? There's a few specific people in the country and uh, his advisor was, was targeting them starting right away. Um, and so uh, Miyoshi was able to get a transfer to UW-Madison uh, to work with uh, Carl Paul Link, who's a pretty big name in biochemistry. Um, and so he left California April 14th, and he had to have a special travel permit, right? This was after March 24th, but he was going to be able to continue going on with his studies. For a lot of college students, they had to leave in March or April or May. Some people got to finish out the semester. Most people did not. And they just left right? So you don't get credit for your college classes, you don't get your tuition back, and you now have several years of not going to school. Um, one of the things, it's a lot harder to go back, right, after you've been out. Uh, and it wasn't like they had people, professors, other college students to talk to about things to keep themselves really uh, in tip-top shape. So this was really valuable for him to be able to transfer at this time. But it was also tricky because there was no system of how to do this. And in fact, the UW president, other administration, they were writing letters to Washington saying, wait, are we allowed to take these? Who are you saying is not allowed to come here? <laughs> who, who should we be treating as disloyal? It is unclear to us. Um, and part of this was that universities like UW Madison, uh, who that had um, a lot of like technical training had already committed to work with the U.S. military. Uh, I think it was Navy and Army was what the uh, UW was doing. And so they had training programs. They were doing uh, training radio technicians. Um, and who knows? I don't know all of the research that they were doing for military purposes on UW campus. But the Navy and the Army came up with a list of prescribed universities that Japanese Americans were not allowed to go to, or at least Japanese. And then it was very confusing. Is a Japanese American the same as the Japanese you don't want? And what if they didn't go to internment camps? And what if they did? What if they were in some other part of the country? All of these questions were really confusing. Um, and so Miyoshi, even though he had this travel permit signed by the person who was the commander in his area, uh, it wasn't exactly what UW was looking for. And how, how was he supposed to get more, you know, paperwork, right? He can't go on back and go ask more people. Um, and the in 1942, there were just a lot of shift, shifting scenarios. So it really was because of his advisor, who wasn't even his advisor at the time. Uh, he was writing letters back to California. He, um, Miyoshi's draft notice came up and he was supposed to be able to, oh, what's the word, uh, put it on hold. Um, yeah, like defer it. Yeah. Um, but you had to talk to your board and he couldn't talk to the, the board. He didn't have anybody up ahead of him. And UW Madison wouldn't vouch for him because he wasn't fully enrolled as a student yet. Right. So it was just like all of these little things trying to work against it. Um, in the end, his advisor really pulled through and helped him be able to get over all of them. Uh, but as I was looking through the archives, it was just obvious he, he couldn't do it, right? Like he couldn't figure out the bureaucracy and tackle it himself. Um, but I'm so glad that he was allowed to come and stay and do his work. Uh, he helped create a chemical called warfarin. Uh, and this is uh, named Warf uh, Wisconsin. 
ARF. Uh, Alumni Research Foundation. Alumni Research Foundation. Thank you. So it's, it's named after Wisconsin right in there. And uh, warfarin was initially used as a uh, rodent poison, rat poison, but then they discovered, so it was very good for that, but then they also discovered that it was like just an anticoagulant enough that if you gave it to humans, it could help them too. Not, not a ton, but we're a lot bigger than rats. So it worked okay for us. So this was actually for uh, 50s and 60s. If you needed an oral anticoagulant for your blood, they, they'd give you warfarin. So uh, it helped a lot of people. Uh, so Miyoshi Akawa, that's uh, his story. Uh, another family, the Nomura family, uh, they were able to get out before internment as well. Um, Hajime, the dad, was a grocery store I'm not sure that he owned it. He might have just been the manager. Um, but he had, um, I think, his boss who owned the, the grocery store. He worked with his boss, and his boss was like, you guys go. I will keep it safe for you. And uh, to his credit, he did. A lot of people didn't do that when they made those promises. So uh, Hajime and Wakaye, they uh, were part of a... Um, uh, Protestant denomination, and so they worked through the larger national associations to uh, contact Madison. Hajime had always wanted to go, uh, at one point he'd wanted to go to UW-Madison, and he didn't have the money for it, but he had it sort of in his mind, I want to go there. And so they were able to make connections. By the time they arrived here, uh, there was a group that called themselves the Madison Relocation Committee. And they had sort of gotten things together. The family was only in temporary housing for a couple weeks uh, when they found this gorgeous house that they were able to uh, let them live in for several years. I mean, they were like paying rent and stuff on it, right? But uh, something that was affordable for them uh, in a, a really great area of town. Um, and they helped them find jobs as well because this is the um, nuclear family here, right? The, the mom and dad and their four kids. Uh, they had an older daughter, son, and then two twin girls. Um, and they they also had, uh, I think it was three of Okaye's um, family and two others of Hajime's all came out together, right? Like you're gonna use the network to get out, right? Um, and so they all found jobs in the area, usually not really what they did, right? Because it was just whatever, whoever was willing to be, give a Japanese American a job. Uh, but they were able to get established. They really love their time here in, uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, and in fact, I um, got to uh, talk with Judy. I can't remember. I don't know which one is Judy because she's one of the twins. <laughs> uh, so she, uh, they eventually moved back to California, but it was through her. She married a UW graduate later on in life. And um, so I was trying to find out about her husband. And then she told me this whole story about her family coming out as well. And um, I think the thing that stood out to me was how much um, it was really like allies in the community who helped them be able to get established and stay for so long uh, before they went back and tried to pick up the remainder of life in California. Oh, so here's some other pictures. Uh, Wakaya had a um, uh, victory garden. I think those look like squash to me, but. <laughs> and their son uh, got to really love playing football in Madison. Uh, and so this is, you know, if, if you were growing up in Madison at the time, right, you might remember the twins with, you know, or uh, I think it was Jimmy uh, who played football, right? Like th these are people that you would have run into uh, in schools. So I've already talked a little bit about internment and resettlement. And even though there were not internment camps here in Wisconsin, that history is a part of our history as well. So one of the people, this is actually the first person I found in the archives that was like, wait, this looks like a story here. Akio Konoshima, uh, I was flipping through the Daily Cardinal uh, college newspapers and um, there were a lot of pictures of the Japanese American boxer. And when it said where he was, what his hometown was, it said it was Heart Mountain, Wyoming. There is only one thing in Heart Mountain, Wyoming at this time, and it is an internment camp, right? And they never mentioned in any of the things that he was from an internment camp or that his family was still there. Um, 
but but this is where like when you know something about the history you can sniff it out right and so i started discovering more about him and um one of the curious things about him is that he his family immigrated when he was six months old so he was not considered an ise he was not considered a second generation and so whereas some of the second generation the u.s government was willing to be like maybe they could be loyal, right? The first generation was still solidly, no, we don't trust them. And so he's the same age as everybody else, but he's in the, we totally don't trust you uh, category. So uh, when he was interned in Heart Mountain, Wyoming, he had been uh, going to college at the time he was in his first freshman year at San Jose State. And he went with his whole family uh, to an internment camp together. Um, he served on agricultural work crews, right? He, because he was in college, there weren't any schooling things he could do, even though they set up like high school and elementary school classes for the kids. And um, he though was trying to get out of the internment camp through, uh, they were doing relocation of college students, trying to get them into other colleges around the country. And um, because he was considered Issei, he wasn't allowed to go leave for quite a while. And then when he was, it was just like a really small town college, someplace that, you know, he wasn't gonna be around anything that they could uh, worry he could uh, cause problems with. Um, but he went to, he had been planning on doing engineering. And you know, two years in an internment camp when you're just doing hard labor all the time, he said he came back to college, he couldn't do the math anymore, right? That kind of high level engineering. And so he switched to journalism and said, I can write, right? I can report, I can, I'm still, that's still where my brain is. And um, in 1944, the US or uh, UW Madison, it wasn't Madison, the only UW was in Madison at the time. So UW was um, taken off of those prescribed lists. And so he was finally able to go to UW and study in their journalism department. And that is where he became a boxing star for a little while because they offered a scholarship. <laughs> uh, I've noticed a lot of Japanese Americans from this area or era were really into boxing. And it was partly because a lot of them who grew up on farms, either in Hawaii or on the West Coast, boxing was what you did. And um, especially in Hawaii, there was a lot of conflict between the different racial groups of workers. And so boxing was a great way to get that out and to defend yourself and uh, to show that you were in charge. Um, so it was like they were getting these skills. And when they got into college, sometimes it was their way into college. Sometimes it was just a thing they could do on the side. And so Akio, uh, he would have said that he wasn't all that great of a boxer, but um, all the other guys were away in the war and he wasn't allowed to sign up. So here he was on the boxing team. He was, he was the best one that was there. Right. Um, uh, oh yeah. So he graduated, uh, he ended up serving in the Korean war. Um, so that was his opportunity to kind of prove himself in a sense. And, um, because he was, you say he was never allowed to fight in world war two because that was the, that was the cutoff. So uh, this is Takayoshi Miyagawa, and he decided to, his name became Richard along the way. So he went by Dick for most of his life. And um, he was from Hawaii. So this is where uh, Akio was a farm boy in California. Uh, Dick was a uh, boxer or a farm boy in uh, Hawaii. And he learned boxing there and boxing was his way off of the islands. Basically it helped him. He was good enough that he could get into college in San Jose state uh, with boxing as his thing. And um, he was so good that in 1942, he was the champion of the NCAA boxing uh, competition at his weight level. Um, so this was pretty awesome. And he, he won it all. And then two days later, maybe it was four days later, he got his notice that he was on his way to an internment camp. Right. So um, no Olympic career for him. <laughs> That's kind of squashed that. Um, he went to, uh, interestingly, when he was at the, not internment camp, but the assembly center, 
he was uh, in a, one of the horse stalls with Akio Konoshima's brother, even though they hadn't like they'd been in different places of the world, right? Uh, but they kind of met there uh, in the uh, the center, right? The assembly center. And this is one thing a lot of Japanese American stories are really dispersed until they find each other in an internment camp or an assembly center and suddenly their lives are going similar directions. Um, so he had uh, some time in Gila River, Arizona. He too was able to get out uh, on a, a college way out of the internment camp. He came to UW-Madison and uh, was starting to box there as well, getting into classes, but he was a Nisei. And that means that he had the option of joining up with the military. Um, and he decided he really needed to prove himself that way, show everybody that even though he'd been interned, he was still a loyal American. So, um, so yeah, he joined up and uh, it was kind of later in the war uh, so he headed to Germany rather than some of the other places uh, right away. But um, yeah, he fought there, came back to the States. One of his interesting parts of his story, he met a Wisconsin girl when he was at UW. Her name was Marion, and uh, they really hit it off a lot. Uh, she worked at the soda fountain in Madison, and uh, he was the you know college boy coming by. Well, when he got shipped down to uh, Georgia or Mississippi for his... Uh, training, uh, she and her sister decided to take a train ride on down. Um, and so they, they took a train ride down. It was kind of on a whim. While they were down there, she and Dick decided to get married, kind of on a whim, right? These are the war bride things, uh, but they really loved each other a lot. And so she waited for him while he was away. And then he came back and they set up life in Madison together uh, as a married couple. Uh, I think they had some kids. And then in 1956, they read a uh, newspaper article that said that some states in the U.S. did not let people of two different races get married. And it turned out, I, I'm really sure it was Georgia. Georgia was one of them. <laughs> and so when they uh, found out their marriage was considered illegal and voided because they had done it in Georgia. Uh, and uh, in fact, if they ever got married in any of the states, it would be void if they went back to Georgia. They, Georgia was not going to uh, listen to any of that. And um, they decided they were never going back to Georgia. So they got married in Wisconsin because it was allowed. And they, they said not many people get married twice to the same person without getting divorced, but they, they did it. So uh, it was something they still wanted to do. Oh, and here it is. That's their their newspaper thing of uh, after Dick died, they were sort of celebrating their marriage. Uh, and yeah. So I mentioned that both of these guys were able to get out of the internment camps and go to college. And this was a big program that was established at this time uh, because while a lot of people thought that this was something that needed to happen for national security issues, there were actually a decent amount of Americans who thought it was horrible. They were like, I can't believe we're doing this. Like, feels like we have to, but it still sounds awful, right? And they were really worried that uh, Japanese Americans would lose out on their, like a generation of college students and um, not have that sort of ability to rise up in the economy and society uh, that that often gives a group. Um, so the U.S. Uh, yeah, government gave this group the job of sort of creating this program from scratch. They were called the National Japanese American Student Relocation Council. And they were the ones that were trying to figure out these prescribed lists. They were coming up with like, okay, these ones are the ones you're not allowed to, so go here. You know, be, be sending out requests, trying to get in, apply to other colleges. Um, and they tried to also, like, all of the bureaucracy, right, that is a part of going to college. Uh, these kids in internment camps often didn't know how to, to deal with it. Um, and so they were working to get them past those hurdles. Uh, they also worked on getting scholarships so that kids could be able to, like at least have travel money or book money 
or uh, tuition, some tuition money, right, to get them out because uh, their parents didn't have anything anymore to help them out with. Uh, they were able to help relocate 3,600 Japanese American college students. And I don't remember if this was like the whole three years or, um, or what, um, but that was a really sort of exciting thing for them that they'd been able to help students get to college. And uh, students still had to like figure out college on their own, right? And a lot of Japanese American students felt like their colleges their whole internment experience and the fact that their parents were interned was something that nobody else cared about, right? So, so there was a kind of loneliness in that, um, even if they didn't, you know, some people experienced racism in the places they went, some people felt like they didn't, but there was just that gap, right, um, that many people experienced. So um, this is a map uh, of all the different places that Japanese American students were. <clears throat> The two, there's some ones that are filled in and some that aren't, they're two different years. Um, but I found all my stuff at UW-Madison because that's where I was looking in the archive. Uh, if you notice, that's one of the, that's a small, pretty small bubble. Uh, I am not sure what place, I, I'm wondering if it's Carroll College because uh, I think that's about in the same area and was there at the time. But uh, I am, this is like, I'm telling you new things that I'm finding, but I bet we have stories all over the state. Um, it, Camp McCoy is higher up, right? And I also don't know what, like, what university that is up there. Um, so, so these are all places that students are going to. Um, and you can kind of see there's other places that have a lot more, but this is something that's happening. We were part of it. Uh, Okay, okay. <laughs> so the last thing to talk about is wartime service. And um, uh, Akira Toki is the, the person I wanted to talk to about this. Obviously, like uh, with Dick Miyagawa, he was also in the military, so that was part of the story. Uh, Akira is our uh, Madison homeboy. Uh, he was uh, born and raised in Madison. Uh, his dad, Henry, came out. Um, worked his way all the way across the U.S. to get to, to Wisconsin and sort of settled down in the farming business. Tried dairy farming, didn't work for him. He uh, ended up getting a wife who was a picture bride, right? So he kind of uh, asked her to come on over, met her at the, uh, the port, and they said, let's do this. So they were really happy. <laughs> and uh, they had, as you see, uh, what is that, four kids. And um, yeah, they all went through uh, Madison area schools during the, um, what would that have been? Sort of 20s, 30s, 40s, had to be 30s and 40s. And um, they felt that the area really supported them fairly well, especially beforehand, they were, um, they were like delivering all their food to the grocery stores, right? So uh, they had some good relationships with that. And even after uh, Pearl Harbor, there's kind of this like general anti-Japanese sentiment, um, especially for people who didn't know them, but the people who were friends with them stayed friends with them and were able to really support them through some of the things uh, that happened. For instance, uh, banks froze all their assets at one point. And so like, what are you gonna do? Um, they also were, um, friends were worried about them driving to all their truck to all the different grocery stores in town. And so um, the American Legion, uh, they were friends with the guy who was the president. And so he got other people to like do their routes for them for a while so that they could stay protected. Um, and that's an interesting, if uh, you're from California, you might hear American Legion and be like, whoa, they were super racist and against the Japanese in California. Uh, but in, at least in Madison, it's kind of like, the people who are part of the organization are the ones who decide who are you going to support. And they really supported this family saying uh, they're American. Their kids are Americans. You don't have to worry about them. They're us, right? Uh, in fact, so Akira uh, had gotten a deferral of his uh, draft notice initially, but as soon as Pearl Harbor happened, um, because drafts went out in November, I guess I didn't 
realize that before. But as soon as Pearl Harbor happened, he was like, I like to get in on this. I want to support the U.S. cause. And so he joined up. But this was actually before they had started the 100th Battalion in Hawaii. And they didn't know what to do with him. In fact, he said the times that he really started experiencing anti-Japanese feelings were, or like from other people was when he joined the military. And people said things like, so y'all, you know, people like you have gone all over this country, huh? <laughs> so he, he was sort of experiencing this kind of exclusion. Uh, he got through basic training, but they wouldn't let Japanese Americans uh, advance beyond that. Uh, he, he and his, the other Japanese, cause there were only like five or six in any given company that were allowed to be Japanese. Um, and so they all got relegated to like desk work. Um, they got sent to a camp, I think camp Grant is in Rockford, Illinois. So they got sent there and it was just like, they were secretaries for the next year and a half. They didn't get to do cool stuff. Uh, they did some training things. The weird thing was that they kept getting rank, like higher ranks for their time in the military, but they weren't actually having experience to go with those ranks. So once Camp Grant got shut down, they got sent out to the front lines. And at that point, the 100th Battalion had been fighting for, you know, uh, almost a year. Uh, they had lost a lot of men and they needed uh, reinforcements. So here comes Akira, right? He's like a corporal at this point. He's going to come in. He's going to take over and help lead. Uh, yeah, the soldiers did not think very highly of that. They were like, this is going to get us killed. Um, and uh, thankfully, these guys were pretty humble about uh, their rank. At one point, they went to the people who were in charge and said, can you just give these stripes? to some guys in my you know, uh, regiment who have a lot more experience than me. Turns out you're not allowed to do that. But um, <laughs> that, that really helped the, the men like have more confidence in them. And whereas initially they started like being kind of tentative, uh, it, at least Akira demonstrated some pretty good um, leadership. Uh, he was part of, um, this is where my lack of military history, uh, an advance in France uh, that they had to they start in Mersiac uh, bottom and went all the way up to, uh, ah, shoot. I, if you have questions about that, I can look at my notes and tell you the details. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he got to fight with the 100th Battalion and uh, came back later after that. So uh, this is his picture as a soldier. And this is him as a veteran. Oh, that's right. He came back to Madison because that's where he's from. Afterwards, um, got married, raised a family. So all of his family now is uh, an additional generation of Madisonians. And um, I think um, at least a number of them have stuck around too. Um, he became really um, kind of a philanthropist, giving back to the community a lot, especially to the veteran center there. Um, and in fact, in my neighborhood, there's a middle school named after him or not. Yeah. Toki middle school. So, um, yeah, he's part of our local history as is camp McCoy. So here I have some uh, pictures of it. Oh, th this one is with the tents, right? Uh, at the beginning. And here, this is when the bar barracks were created uh, in October. Here's first snow for these Hawaiians. Uh, so. Uh, so some final thoughts here. The thing I've already said is uh, that, in my opinion, Japanese history is all of our history. Uh, you might have noticed I am not Japanese, um, <laughs> but I have really loved getting to know Japanese American history. And I I do Asian American history as my main focus. And the thing I'm always surprised about is how many points of contact my history had, like my family's history, right, has with these uh, stories of other people who you might think, oh, it's somebody else's history. But no, it's actually our history. And um, that's a really exciting thing to realize and to be able to locate uh, these various different histories with ours. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, uh, so the statement here, 
that the recovery of Japanese Americans after World War II was not something that they just achieved on their own. Now, this became kind of a myth after World War II that um, Japanese Americans, like, they had everything taken away from them, which they did. Uh, they were interned, imprisoned, right, incarcerated for several years. And then, you know, 10, 20 years later, look, they're doing so well in society. They are a perfect example, or so the myth said, of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, right? Everybody take note. You too should just follow their example. Uh, you might have heard this uh, called that they're a model minority, right? Uh, so this is where that term came in. And um, one of, this has often been used towards other minority groups uh, that might not be doing so well to say, stop asking for more, right? Don't keep asking society to do things for you. Just be like these model minorities and do it yourself. Right? And this particularly became in the late 1960s as civil rights uh, activists had won some kinds of reforms, right? Like uh, voting rights, right? Uh, and some equal access rights, right? But um, they were looking for things like give us equality in jobs so that we can like pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, so to speak. Um, or, you know, like give us ac equal access to schools that are getting money from rich neighborhoods, right? Because our schools are funded by neighborhoods. Um, and these things were just like hard pass, right? Where you're asking too much. Look at these model minorities, be more like them. Um, one of the things I just was impressed by as I was looking at the archives, is that this basic part of model minority ideas that the Japanese Americans did it themselves is just wrong. <laughs> they didn't. There were all these groups and people, we would call them allies today, right, uh, who were working together. There were a lot of government resources that were going in to try to help keep Japanese Americans going so that they didn't just get stagnant or stymied in the internment camps. Um, and I think it's really important to study history and all the different parts of history so we don't get into these kind of uh, uh, reducing something down to what works politically for us at the time. Um, so for Japanese Americans, really a, a turnaround for them in society required heavy investment, help by friends and allies and government support to undo the ravages of internment and the redistribution that happened, right? Losing all of their, much of their property and uh, uh, land and other stuff in the West Coast. So, so those are sort of my two takeaways from what I've been learning. And um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm leaving with it with. <laughs> And I guess I'll open it up if you have any questions or things that you would like to know more about. Um, I would be happy to uh, answer questions. Yes. What's the process of them leaving these internment camps? I mean, did they just open the doors and say goodbye? Um, they really wanted to. <laughs> so um, after a while, they. Uh, needed to find ways of getting people to leave because even though uh, it was not idyllic in any way, right? Um, if you don't have anything to go back to, uh, if you don't know where else you can go, right? Uh, at least right here, you have some shelter and you're growing stuff and you have some, you know. So it was pretty hard actually to get them out. Um, People, some people really wanted to leave, and so they would uh, follow uh, the college students who were getting out. Oftentimes, if they had family back in the um, internment camps, a family would first go to where their college student was, and then they would kind of move on from there, sort of look, looking for jobs in the area. Um, and yeah, a lot. But they had no money at all. Or like transportation? Or so I'm trying to remember if there was transportation given people places. 
I don't remember that there was transportation given them. So one thing that happened was that if you had a brother in the army uh, and your family was in an internment camp, they were sending a lot of their military paycheck back to the internment camp so that you could have some money. Um, also, there were like uh, Akio Kodoshima was on work cruise. So he was in Heart Mountain with Wyoming and there were beet farmers who needed uh, help taking in the crops, you know, doing all the, the labor. And many of the people who would have done the labor for them were in the military now. And so uh, interns, work crews would do it uh, for pretty minimal money, but they got some as a paycheck. Um, but, but yeah, this was, this was a tricky. An enormous amount of people suddenly I know. free. Yeah. So it's not, it didn't happen all at one time, right? It happened over maybe like two years. So FDR said in, oh, it was like maybe December of 43, he was like, okay, we want to close. Maybe it was December of 44. That would make more sense because the war was kind of wrapping up then. Um, it was like, okay, we want to shut these things down uh, by summer. This next summer, 55 or 45, we're going to close them. Well, they couldn't close them for another year because it took people so long to, to move out. Um, so I can't give you a lot more specifics on the process than that. But, um, but yeah, it was not an easy thing. Uh, there were some people who had land that had been sort of like kept safe for them. Um, some people had... Uh, signed things that they thought were leases while they were in internment camp. And then it turned out that they were signing away the property uh, that they had access to. Um, there were also a lot of Japanese Americans didn't own land. Uh, so they, as uh, for the Issei, the first generation, they were not allowed to own land in their own names. So a lot of them took land in the names of their children who were U.S. citizens. Um, but a lot of people were leasing. And so they were like saving money so they could buy their land. And then that was kind of not an option anymore. Uh, I've heard of other people who their land uh, deteriorated while they were gone. And so the U.S. government decided to uh, use that land. Uh, what is it called when the government can reclaim land and then use it for a project? Uh, yeah, eminent domain. So then they decided to use that land. Uh, to uh, build whatever it was that they were gonna build there. So um, there were a lot of different forms that it could take about not having land to go back to. Um, but people still often went back because it was what the area where they knew, so yeah. Oh, yes. This isn't a question, it's a possible answer. When you had the map up and you were looking at the spot near Green Bay and in Milwaukee. The one near Green Bay, if you're still doing research, might be St. Norbert's College. Oh, okay. My guess would be that some of them, that that might have been a place of some report. Milwaukee, even though it wasn't part of the university system, at that point had the largest state teacher's college. In the Ooh, okay. And UW Milwaukee has a very fine archive. So if if that was part of what was your mm -hmm. big splotch on that map near the Milwaukee area, <laughs> I don't know if you're done because your dissertation is done or if you're still doing something. So it. what's funny is that my dissertation has nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, I told people, oh, sure, this will be like my second project, right? So, well, uh, hopefully, I'll be able to get my brain recalibrated after grad school and go uh, do this. This has been a really exciting project, and at times more exciting than my dissertation. So, uh, that just happens sometimes when you're grad student. Yeah. It's a little off subject, but there's an interesting book I have. It's called Stalag, Wisconsin, about. It's about German POW camps that were in the state. I have heard about German POW camps, but I haven't they read books about all it. All over. Wow. Lobbying industry. Yeah. Uh, Working for a cannery. Yeah. Picking fruit and vegetables. You right. Go to Zarconi, they go to pick cherries. Wow. And, I mean, Wisconsin has a lot of German Americans, right? So it wasn't just a, you're German go to the POW camp. Were these people who had been engaged with things with 
So these were Germans like who had been captured in Europe. Okay. I know, right? Well, there was a German internment, but I'm not sure that there was in World War II. There was definitely internment of Germans who were not citizens. I don't think we ever did anything with the, the people who had been born here. Mm. But if you had uh -huh. immigrated, there was some German internment. It wasn't anywhere near the, yeah. the volume of the Japanese. Well, and part of it was that German Americans had it really bad for World War One. So I remember that, like, if you if you study that era, that was kind of their era. Uh, they didn't get interned in quite the same way, but that was the if you speak German, right? This is when like a bunch of German city names got changed the spelling, or we changed the way we said them, or stuff. Yeah. I read a, a book, Harry Truman's Car. It was bought his life after he left office, and. Um, there was a lot of controversy when he dropped it, uh, bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But even before that, there was a lot of discussion. There was going to be so much collateral damage, and it's a good thing. You maybe shouldn't do it. But Truman decided that was a thing to do. And um, for the rest of his life, he lived until 1972. He got death threats. He had, to, he had no phone in his home. Because people were calling them all, but that that was, wasn't really brought out when I was in high school. That there were a lot of people that really, um, you know, sure the enemy is one thing, but you know, destroying the lives of people either by bombing or by just injuring. There was a lot. There was a lot of there was sentiment, you know, pro. Yeah. Well, I think it's tricky, right? Because so historians, one of the things that we do, uh, especially, you know, like uh, I'm in, I'm turning 40 this year, right? So uh, there's a lot of distance between me and World War II. <laughs> uh, and so the way that I learn about it, right, is I'm looking at sources, right? And so I'm going through, you know, newspapers, maybe seeing what people are writing about. There's the uh, main editorials, there's the opinion section. You can often find a little, a lot of really awful stuff in opinion sections. Uh, not surprisingly, right? Well, it's sort of comment sections today online are like that too. And um, so, yeah, it's tricky because sometimes we, we are just looking at those things and there's some really awful stuff. And as I showed you, like it's motivating huge actions towards people. But then I also would find a bunch of articles or opinion pieces of people being like, how can we do this and still say that we appreciate these American values? And, and yeah, like maybe we do have to do it, but what can we do to try to minimize the damage, right? And, and I think that that is part of the story as well. Um, it makes me a little bit more encouraged that in my time, when I see things that I might think are awful, right, that it's not like that I can take inspiration from past times too, right? There's been a lot of awful stuff in the past. And I, people then, there were people who stood against it. And I can take a stand against it too. And I might not be able to turn the course of the, you know, large scale history of what's happening. But I can make a difference. And I think that's with these uh, people as well, right? Like parts of the reasons... Uh, everybody I was looking at was mostly in Madison, right? Part of the reason they loved Madison was because of these connections they had with people, the kind of haven that people were able to help them have in this time when, like, if they drove outside of Madison and people didn't know them, uh, Akira Toki got pulled over by a sheriff in uh, a town like 40 miles south uh, who was like, you're you're Japanese and you're in a car with a California license plate. We're we're taking you in, in right? Uh, so that this happens all the time, um, but they still had those connections with people who were able to to help them get through it. So, yes, sir. Is there a reason why there were so many Japanese in the United States? Uh, a reason for their immigration? And the other thing mm -hmm. is. The leader of Japan thought he was God, 
and the people supported God. But did the Japanese in the United support States support God, or were they more westernized? Um, so uh, there are two questions in there. So the first one, why were there so many Japanese in, in the United States? Uh, the easiest answer was the U.S. needed workers, uh, particularly in like the late 1800s, early 1900s. So we know of a lot of people coming over at that time from Europe, right? Uh, and on the West Coast, it's a lot easier if you get people coming <laughs> from Asia. Uh, there were a bunch of, um, what are they called, labor recruiters who went to Japan and they were saying, uh, for often like come to Hawaii, right? We, we need you on the plantations there. Uh, but there were ones in the West Coast as well. Um, and so there was like um, canneries in Washington. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, Kira Toki's dad came over. Um, I'm trying to remember what he came over for initially. Um, but then he worked on the railroad coming across. Um, not, not the railroad, the transcontinental railroad. That was the like 1850s. Right, but he was doing stuff uh, across, uh, working that way before he got to Madison. Uh, so most people stayed, uh, especially Japanese Americans got really into um, farming in California. In the early 1900s, uh, California was becoming this like, you know, not bread basket, but like vegetable <laughs> fruit basket. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, uh, lettuce and asparagus and all these kinds of things um they were really investing heavily in making a lot of desert area to be uh, uh able to be farmed and japanese americans got really into that um, this was actually part of the reason why they started in california making what they called alien land laws uh where uh the those aliens ineligible of citizenship weren't allowed to own land uh and it was because they were doing well and a way to cripple your competition is to make sure they don't get the, the land ownership right so um so these things were kind of connected but it was mostly for, through labor that they were coming at that time oh and your second question yeah, that was, the emperor of japan was considered god yeah and so they mm -hmm. they fought because they were yeah following god, I guess. so um uh, emperor worship was something that the federal U.S. government was really concerned about because there had been a lot of emperor celebration before Pearl Harbor, right? Like there were emperor parades and stuff in Japanese areas, uh, just even if, you know, the year or two before it happened. Um, Japanese American uh, connection with Japan is really uh, complicated because since they were excluded here in the United States, a lot of that first generation uh, kept very strong ties with Japan. And in fact, because um, there was this idea that if your country was really, your home country was really strong, it helped you have a better place in the United States. Uh, people would treat you better, basically. And in, in fact, that was what happened with the Japanese um, that they got some, the U.S. in their treaties with Japan, they had to promise that Japanese Americans would have, have certain rights that other Asian Americans weren't allowed to have, like bringing, letting women come over so that you could form families, right? Um, and like just mobility more and stuff like that. So when Japan started taking off, right, as a power, they were excited. They were really happy. This will, this was reflected well on them, right? A lot of them loved the emperor. Uh, the, they saw this as a wonderful thing and, and proof that they too had, you know, great blood, right? Uh, their race also was great. Um, and in fact, um, Japan was sort of fighting China uh, before they attacked us. And uh, the U.S. was supporting China and Japanese Americans were not. They were definitely supporting what Japan was doing uh, over in Asia and usually often listening to that kind of uh, supportive rhetoric for it. But when the United States was uh, attacked, it is true that some like of the like grandparents, right? Like the, the very older generation were, were cheering for this. Uh, 
But by and large, people were kind of like, we, we love that Japan is getting strong, but not our country, right? There, there was definitely this, this had become their country, even though they were not fully uh, pulled into it, right? Like assimilated in. Um, so that, that would be, there was some of it was my answer, but uh, they didn't, um, there are really very few examples of people who were like, take one for the emperor. <laughs> <laughs> was there a hand further back? Yes. Uh, just, I just had a comment on what the answer um, uh, <laughs> Just that this was um, not necessarily chosen by the women. I mean, that they, their families mm -hmm. were sending them and that it wasn't, you know, a let's do this situation. It was, you know, you pick my picture, we're getting married, let's have a family, mm -hmm. that's it. You mm -hmm. know, it wasn't, it wasn't, a, wasn't necessarily a happy thing. Yeah. Um, and then the other one was something that you already addressed, which was basically um, corporate land grabs by um, agriculture in California. The Japanese farmers were very successful and they were really responsible for about 40% of the production in California. And so to incarcerate them was really, um, you know, the U.S. was shooting themselves in the foot by doing that because they were undercutting production of, um, you know, produce mm -hmm. for the, our society and for our military as well. Yeah. Um, but they did it in response to corporate pressure. Yeah. And it's so interesting, like, so much expertise got sidelined in the internment camps, too. Uh, so I, I remember one of the pictures, I didn't put it in, but um, somebody who had been, like, an ex a landscape, head of the landscape company in California, um, he was on one of the desert internment camps, and he created... Uh, like he had water, right? Like a little uh, pool and he had things growing around it, right? He, he landscaped the desert right there in the internment camp, right? And it, it just reminded me, I think I had a picture up there too of people who were working on, um, uh, they were uh, nets that uh, can hide, behind, like they, they mask things. Camouflage. Yeah, camouflage nets. Like they were, they were creating them, right? Uh, using sewing skills, right? Uh, so there was a lot of expertise that came out of society. Some of it, the US government found ways to still use uh, during internment, but, um, but yeah, it was also not out in society at the time. I'm going to call it there. Thank you so much. Can everyone join me in just thank you for it again? I will say I found this super interesting. I learned a whole lot, so I hope everyone else enjoyed it as well. Um, I would also like to ask everyone to also help me um, thank the people who have helped me make these programs happen. Um, so for um, our people making sure that uh, everyone can watch this online, if you guys want to watch this again, maybe we we you didn't uh, you want to refer back to something Joy said or anything like that, this is going to be on our website, um, so you can uh, watch it again as well as a couple of our other programs as well. Um, but thank you to Greg and Lizzie, um, to Karen, our bartender, um, to everyone here at the museum who's really helped us um, bring these programs to you. They've, been, they've just been doing some great work. So. <laughs> um, and um, thank you. Thank you for showing up. Um, thank you for watching online. And if you guys enjoy programs like these and you want to see more of them here at this museum, um, please consider supporting the museum. And that can come in a whole bunch of different forms. Um, you can donate. Um, you can become a member. Or um, if you want to you know, help us um, make these things happen, uh, you can also consider volunteering here at the museum. We are happy for everyone to um, support us in any different way. We really appreciate it. Um, but uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, I will say uh, next month on June 1st, we're going to have a really interesting talk um, about the AAPGB. 
the uh, um, the uh, the it's the uh, uh, all women's baseball league that inspired a league of their own. Um, so we're going to have a, a person from the Racine Heritage Museum talk about the Racine Bells, um, who were the first uh, champions uh, of that league. So that's going to be a super exciting talk. That's going to be on June first. Um, so I hope you guys come out to that. And if you want to learn uh, more, maybe about more of that uh, the story from inside the internment camps, or look more at those. Um, the photos of the internment camps. We do also have our book of the month this year is up, or this month is uprooted, um, and that's in our store um, right now. So if you guys are interested in that, um, take a look. Um, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.